Hello? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to just say that it's an honor to be here. Um, it's very touching to see all of you here tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Minister Shimada, um, Deputy Director Higuchi, thank you, um, the curator uh, Atsushi Iwai, who um, it's just been amazing to work together, and all the other amazing people that I've worked with here at the JICC. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a body of work that I've really been working on my whole life since after undergraduate, um, ranging from roughly 2004 until today. And um, I've always uh, had a passion for origami starting from a young age. And um, I've incorporated the the fundamentals of folding into my artwork. Um, so I feel especially at home um, to be here affiliated with the Japanese Embassy and hope that this is the beginning um, of a relationship that travels also to Japan. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start um, and tell you how, how we're here today and, and why I'm making this work. It all started with the simple flapping crane. Um, when I was a really young child, um, just like many children all around the world, my dad taught me how to make the flapping crane. And um, I made it over and over and over again. And this is something that is universal and global and that everyone can get excited about. Um, Then I got interested and I asked for origami books and um, origami paper and I was so excited the first time I got origami paper because I didn't have to make the rectangular paper into a square. Um, they already came that way and they were all different colors and easily foldable. And um, one of the first things I taught myself how to do by myself from a book was the balloon. Because um, if anyone's seen those origami books with directions, they're not always um, easy to figure out right away. So once I figured out the balloon and then blew air into it, um, I had a, an epiphany. And I saw that not only can you take something flat and make it something three-dimensional, but you can also make it dynamic. Um, and not just give it shape, but give it uniqueness. So. What I put up here are the four shapes that um, I was most obsessed with as a child. And instead of learning how to do uh, many different kinds of shapes and forms, I pretty much just made these four shapes over and over and over again. <laughs> so on the top uh, left, you have a cup. And the story behind that is when I was probably about eight years old, I was at the Cleveland Museum of Art um, with my mom, and there was uh, a workshop for children. They were a little bit older. I think that they were probably 12 years old, and they were, it was a class, and they were having their last class, and um, we asked if I could join, and because they were doing origami, and they said yes. So I joined and learned how to make the cup, and of course we put juice in it and drank out of it. And that was kind of really exciting to see. Not only can you like give body to a piece of paper, but it can also serve a function. Um, and then the other shape that I didn't tell you guys the story about is the strawberry. Um, when, when the Building Museum in Washington, D.C. opened, they had an event for World Origami Day. And um, I, I think I was the only child at the table at that event, and the the woman who was giving the the demonstration was teaching um, us to make all different shapes, some abstract and um, some non-abstract, and and the one that I excelled at and that really stuck with me was the strawberry, because much like the balloon, um, you can you can make it dynamic, and. Um, and even though blowing air into a strawberry is an act of construction, it's really an act of destruction to the, to the, 
formal shape of the paper. Um, and you'll see later on that that pl plays uh, a role in my work. Um, so I put this photo, this is taken from the Washington Ballet website. Um, I spent a lot of years uh, at the Washington School of Ballet learning classical ballet. Um, still when, when it was um, run by Mary Day, the founder, and I was lucky to be her student. Um, and she was very, very no-nonsense. Um, and our, our uniforms were, were just completely essential and elemental, just what you see here, tights, leotard, uh, raw linoleum floor, unfinished wood bar. And, and that really had an aesthetic effect on me. Um, my mom is an architect and my dad uh, was, a model, is, was a model maker, he's retired now, um, and also an artist. And, and this was kind of like my zone and it was where I learned how the body moves in space. I think it's kind of was the gateway to my love for fashion. But really, it was, it was understanding the body and, and movement. And, um, and I see clothing as a first layer. And, and for clothing to fit really well, it has to fit the body. And just like buildings, for buildings to feel really well, they also have to fit the body. Um, so I put this picture here. This is uh, a scrapyard in Rockville, Montgomery Scrap. Uh, I used to go here with my dad on weekends, and this looks kind of ominous and unfriendly. Um, there were also, this is pretty much my memories of, of what it was like to walk around the scrapyard. So we, we would see materials um, after they were completely destroyed, ready to be recycled. Um, and then here you have stainless steel. So that's, that's where I, I um, went with him. And he, he was looking for materials for his um, sculptures. He made sculptures out of found uh, metals. And what I really learned there was to learn about the different materials and their characteristics and, and just appreciating these materials in nature in states of decay, uh, which I found really exciting. Uh, I put this picture here. This is uh, an Isimiyaki dress. Uh, when I was a teenager, I went to a wedding of a friend of my parents, uh, also an architect, and she wore this dress. And I remember thinking that, that it wasn't the shape of her body that I could see, but it was the shape of the dress. And I was really kind of like blown away. I thought, you know, she looked like a dinosaur at the time. Um, but I was amazed that a fabric can have its own body and not the body of the person wearing it. And then I kind of did some research and I, I looked into Pierre Cardin from uh, the 50s and 60s, how he was using pleats, another Pierre Cardin. And then in the 90s, Issey Miyake came along and kind of changed the whole game. Um, with pleats and dynamic pleats and, and kind of really emphasizing that the body gives shape to the clothes, but the clothes also have their own shape and their own identity. And it's, you know, clothes for art's sake. Some more Isimiyaki from the early 90s. And then later in the 90s, uh, Isimiyaki collaborated with uh, Dai Fujiwara uh, with the collection APOC, which stood for a piece of cloth. And this collection really blew me away because it was all about that clothing was on a mass-produced roll. And you would just cut out clothing to suit your individual style. And the whole idea of mass-produced unique was kind of revolutionary to me. Here, uh, during the fashion show, you can see all the models are still on the same roll, not cut out. And I thought this was amazing, that everyone can be the same and everyone is unique. And that was the same message I was getting um, from art when I was studying 
artists like Andy Warhol and the Campbell Soup Cans, that you know everyone picks their own flavor, um, and they're all unique, but they're all the same. They're all Campbell Soup. Uh, here I put my mom in a construction site. My mom is my biggest influence um, and inspiration and also supporter. And she's always encouraged uh, me to do my own thing. And to she's encouraged my craziness. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, here's a picture of us in the early 2000s. This was about the same time that I was making my assemblages and my starting my metal sculptures. And, um, and I would go and hang out with people in the office and go on the construction site tours together. The whole office would go to the construction site in DC. Um, and they would meet with the contractors and I would just kind of wander around and, and like, appreciate the materials and the structure before uh, the buildings were ruined with function. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is me jumping around and um, acting relatively safe in a construction site. Uh, at the time, my job, my unofficial job was a color selector. Um, so I, I was selecting the different colors. Uh, usually, uh, everything was a neutral color, but in public spaces and circulation spaces, like stairs, railings, um, I would choose bright colors. And the reason for that was because in the city, nature is rare. And uh, nature always gives color in life. And I thought that if we can't have nature, we can still give that feeling of color in life. And that's where the bright colors came from. They didn't, they were evergreen. So then <laughs> they stayed colorful through the winter. And, um, and then in these repetitive spaces, like the green stairs, I would notice how the light goes through. And I think that this also comes out with the folds in the work. Um, in my last year of art school, in art school I focused mainly on painting, representational painting that was focused on fashion. And, and I, I don't know if this had anything to do with it, but um, after September 11th, fashion di didn't feel like it had any purpose, like flat things. I was like, why am I painting? What's the point? And I really, I, I yearned for something more tactile and more physical and to kind of, um, to do things with my hands and to get dirty. And, and you know, the process of, of painting was, um, I was getting my hands dirty, but, but it had, it had a, a frame and a limit and, and I needed um, some of that destruction that I, that was familiar from the scrapyards that I was visiting as a child. Um, so what I started doing and what I have here uh, is a detail. I started folding and crumpling up my paintings and basically destroying them um, or repositioning them with caution tape and other things that I associated with construction. At this time, I was also kind of getting back into the idea of folding, except not in a representational way, in an abstract way. And something that's always interested me with folds is not doing the most complicated fold, but seeing how can I see a simple fold in a new way. So I was looking um, at different simple ways of folding paper and really you know, exercises of s architectural structure in paper. And then, um, basically, at this point, folding paper for me was like sketching. So instead of drawing sketches, I would fold paper. I would go to the cafe and fold paper. Um, and it was very exciting. <laughs> and I still do that. And then just organizing them in different ways, um, just having fun, experimenting um, in ways that, that you can't necessarily experiment with on a larger scale. At the same time, I was exploring materials and fabric. And this is a black aluminum mesh. 
I was knitting construction tape. I was going to Home Depot and in my head pretending like I was a construction worker, <laughs> but not making functional things. Um, and it just felt very, very exciting. Um, so I was taking things like, I was going to Home Depot and, and buying like rolls of uh, aluminum sheets that they use for flashing and um, construction tape and burlap. And, you know, someone who saw what I was buying probably thought that I had a building project. But, um, but there's no responsibility in art. You can do whatever you want. Um, and also in this one, you can see that there's the beginning of folding metal. Um, those folds I did by hand, there was no welding. It was also aluminum. Uh, in this one, I was experimenting more with folding, aluminum, flashing, and I was doing this all by hand. This was before I learned how to weld. In the assemblages, I was also taking something that interested me that, that I was doing at the same time as the, the steel sculptures were the assemblages. And in the assemblages, I was kind of taking materials like this copper, which I found at the scrapyard, and it was completely curled up. And so I uncurled it and flattened it to put it in the assemblage. Um, so I was kind of like working forwards and backwards with the characteristics of materials and using recycled things and new things. I was also uh, exploring these folds in ideas of fashion. And, and mostly this had to do with going back to ballet and going back to buildings, trying to understand the role of the body in space. And then I was exploring folding paper and the role of the body in these folds. You know, where, where does fashion get involved? What's abstract? What's representational? It was all kind of a mystery, and it still is. Um, and also, how, how does my body fit into these sculptures? Um, so, I mean, scale-wise, that's pretty much right on, like with the icing shell sculpture at the entrance. And I was doing etchings and things like that, but really the drawings came after the actual uh, construction and fabrication of the sculptures, because the sketches for those sculptures were always done in paper. And at the same time that I was making the metal sculptures, I was sewing the same folds in fabric and kind of, again, trying to find my place with these materials. In the assemblage on the wall and the modular sculpture um, behind me in this picture, um, they were both done at the same time. And, and in the assemblage at the top, what you see there, the neon orange, is a crumpled up outfit that I had sewn that was, um, you know, just like fashion, not suitable to wear in real life, um, but in art, repurposed. And I had a teacher, uh, John Yao, a writer, um, when I was at MICA, and he said that you can't be promiscuous in your life, but you can and you should be in your ideas. And that's something that stuck with me. So here's a close up. More paper sketches of the sculptures that would follow. And uh, sketches that were done after the fact. <laughs> um, but just kind of Drawing was for me to explore ideas of shapes. Um, so now I, I just want to briefly go into uh, the process of, of the All Real, All Steel series, because um, it, it was a real dialogue about a relationship between me and 
four foot by eight foot sheets of cold rolled steel. They, they would arrive in my driveway and I would put two pieces of wood underneath them. That's the curve you see so they wouldn't just stick on the ground because each one was just about a millimeter thick and weighed about 50 pounds each. So they were kind of flimsy and unruly. But somehow I dragged them into the studio and leaned them against the wall. And what I would do is I would make patterns um, in increments of four foot by eight foot sheets. Um, and what you see here, N's and O's, stand for in or out fold. And I just was using these two types of in and out folds M very similar to knitting. Um, if you're familiar, there's only two stitches, knit and purl. And, and basically every knitted structure is made from those two stitches. Um, so the same things with my foldings. There were only two basic types of folds that I was really using and reconfiguring in different ways. So it would just start out as a sheet and I would mark them with Sharpies on the floor and then cut them out with uh, 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 sh el an electric sheet metal shear. So they would be pieces like this and I would then fold them in a, a five foot break that I had. Here is me folding because you can only fold in one direction. You can't fold in two. That's why I'd have to put them in pieces and, and then weld the rest. So that's how it would look in the break. And um, yeah, it was just very flimsy and unruly and um, smelled like machine oil. Then I'd have all these pieces and uh, would coordinate them with little pieces of tape and little labels, like if somebody was sewing. And I would always wear cowboy boots because the pointy tips were very easy to walk in the folds of these sculptures and not slip. And they also protected my ankles from getting cut. Um, so this is basically my welding setup. Um, here's a piece that's pretty much assembled. This is um, the column at the entrance, the vertical column. That's how it started. And the tubes that you can kind of see, the, um, what are they called, balloons, uh, gas balloons on the end, it's just oxygen and acetylene welding. So it's just very low tech for anyone who is familiar with welding. And the reason for that was because the metal was one millimeter thin. It was so thin that uh, it would melt right away if I used some kind of electric or arc welding. So I used low-tech welding, which was good because then I could even weld in a t-shirt and even if I got some sparks, they weren't that hot and there wasn't UV radiation. Um, and here, I'm just showing how I would like tack the welds and I wouldn't weld all the way at once so that I could distort the form if I wanted to and then I would continue the welding. Then. Then to make it the column that you see at the entrance, I climbed in and I pushed it open and then turned it, curved it in a different way. It's kind of hard to um, visualize, but it was very physical. And um, this is what I compare it to ballet. I was used to being pulled and stretched to my limits. Um, and that's what I wanted to do to the steel. <laughs> um, and but the thing is, is that the steel was also pushing me to my limits. Um, and, and that was kind of, that, that was what drove me to do it because it was that push and pull relationship that I was really getting something from this in, in, inanimate material, giving it some kind of a life. Pretending like I was a surfer. Um, that was the finished product of, of the previous slide. Uh, also, what you see here is a 10 pound sledgehammer. All of the distortions of the sculptures that have distortions um, were made using that sledgehammer. And then once I fabricated them, I would get them on a truck or get them in my Jeep and take them to Southern Galvanizing Company in Baltimore. Um, and then they would 
just come with their heavy equipment and take it away. And this is how it looked, um, welded and kind of in decay, rusty, alongside some materials that were already galvanized for industry or construction. And then to galvanize it, this was really cool. It was an industrial process. The pieces were hung on racks and they were degreased, dipped in acid, and then they were dipped in these vats of molten zinc and the vats were about nine foot by 30 feet by nine feet deep, so roughly the size of a tractor trailer. And of course it worked perfectly that way so that everything they galvanized would fit on a truck for construction. Um, and they would dip it in there and then men would just kind of jiggle it around and make sure that, that they got baked properly and they became non-corrosive. And seeing them come out and hung in the air is just kind of a revelation because um, it's something that's done by hand uh, and then seen in an industrial process and that's um, not something that, that um, is that common anymore. <coughs> so this is uh, my X piece and all the steel pieces were done in a modular way so that you could rearrange them in different ways. Um, based on the context or the space. Because I always considered the pieces to be alive in space and, and the context really matters more than the piece itself. So they have to have a relationship. And this is the X as I envisioned it um, and it came together so I was very happy that day that it didn't fall down. Um, there's no like fasteners or anything. The folds keep it together. And then that's the same X configured in a different way, um, in a different space. So I put this piece in because I just wanted to show that for the most part, a lot of them fit in my car and somehow with my determination, I always got them in there. Some pieces did not fit in the car and they were brought on trucks to the office and uh, everyone who worked at the office at the time, and Winston is here somewhere, he'll remember this, that basically everything would stop and we'd do hard labor. Um, and the biggest challenge was always kind of getting these pieces in the door. So it would take like three or four of us, some carrying and some pushing them together. These are the two icing shells. One that was fabricated um, just as, as it was put together and the other one that was fabricated and then I smashed it with a sledgehammer and that's the one that's at the entrance. This, this was the first large scale piece of that I made. It's called Blondes Have More Fun. And um, <laughs> it's called that because I, this one I really like was, you know, learning about the material and, and kind of trying to push it to its boundaries. And in this one, I, I formed uh, these distortions with the sledgehammer. And I had so much fun um, doing that, that I was like, oh, this is so fun. This must be a blonde. And then this is uh, another, another way that it was assembled in a different space. Here is the piece that is in the center of the exhibition. And um, I just, I wanted to put this piece in because the way that we had it um, in the office was kind of in front of the window. And, and the way that light comes through these folds is a really um, cool and dynamic thing, especially during different times of the day. And I wish that, you know, that we had this option of daylight in every space. Um, so I just um, wanted you to, to know that the material changes based on different light. 
and kind of give an idea of the chaos that was starting to go on in the office <laughs> as I was making more and more pieces. Um, this one leaning against the wall was also formed in this way. Um, so they're the same piece, just in a different configuration. And then this piece, which is in this show, um, also was able to um, be arranged. I've arranged it as a donut on the ground, or also like this, in a more precarious um, structure. And then this is kind of the direction of what was going on in our office. And uh, I was getting short on space. So I ended up having to put some in some friends' yards. Um, they are non-corrosive. And also exploring different materials, which leads me to the mesh. Uh, the mesh is, is very light. It's also metal, and, but it has very soft characters. And, and instead of, instead of uh, using, like with the All Real All Steel series, I would only use you know, up to eight, four feet by eight foot sheets and make a sculpture. But with the mesh, I'd use a lot more mesh, so a lot more folds, and, um, and, and distort them in a much more organic result. So in this picture, I'm, I'm folding like 100 feet of mesh. Also into the similar folds, and, and um, they, they were backed with plywood, which is what gave it shape. That I would then paint um, in different colors. And the result would be kind of like these very organic shapes uh, where the folds are very easy to see, but not, not in their typical rectilinear formation. Much more round, much more related to nature. And then I was starting to get excited about the forms that the mesh makes itself without, without any structure behind it, but much like the All Real All Steel series where the material is its own structure. And that is what I'm continuing today and where I am in this journey. I see it as kind of like an industrial fabric. And the pleating by hand really gives each pleat um, a uniqueness because they look uniform from far away, but really they're not completely uniform. So just kind of continuing that, that relationship with the mesh. And how, how does it relate to itself and to space? Whether it's hung or it stands alone. Um, so I just want to end with my favorite quote from a Stanley Kunitz poem called The Layers. And in it, he says, live in the layers, not on the litter. And that's what I try to do. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Nuni. Thank you. So we will go on to the uh, Q&A uh, section of this event. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Okay. You were using a certain term which I wasn't sure um, was pronounced a certain way. Assemblage or assemblage? Assemblage, yes. Okay, is that similar to like tapestry? Uh, so assemblage is, is essentially a collage. 
that's made with materials, or three-dimensional materials, um, where a, a collage is usually paper, assemblage uh, usually has the third dimension. Um, so you could say that a tapestry is an interpretation of a, an assemblage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there a medium that you haven't had a chance to work with that you like want to work with or mm -hmm. due to limitations, like some machinery that you want to try working with as well? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there's like so many materials that I want to work with. Um, I'm sure a lot of materials that I haven't, that I don't know about. Um, I'm interested in working with uh, metal because it's kind of found in nature, but I'm also interested in working like with plastics and vinyls and things like that. Um, I'm very interested in, in working uh, like at a textile mill that does uh, high-tech pleating with all these new high-tech fabrics. Um, yeah, there's something very earthy about metal, but uh, for me, it's just like the repetition of the folding, and, and it's kind of that the infolds and the outfolds, and it's kind of like the waves that wash in and wash out, and the breath that you breathe in and you breathe out, um, but it's, it's it's all about keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, Nuni, I just want to say, first of all, it's great to hear a presentation by an artist that has such great breadth from your five-year-old projects to your final projects, and it puts the audience into the actual making of it we can begin to appreciate it in so many other ways. And I just want to congratulate you for making that so apparent and presentable and understandable because we often don't see that in the work and presentations of certain artists. And I thank you for that. I only had one question. Oh, uh, I also was so excited about how you brought, and you can bring dance and fashion design, architecture and art together in your own way. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, wonderful to see that and to see you constantly flipping back and forth mm -hmm. between one emphasis and another. That was also... Yeah, something that I just want to add is that, yeah. is that, yes, it was all happening and it is all happening at the same time yeah. because it's all about like trying to understand our place in this world and that's done through the layers and all the different layers are clothing, buildings, um, ideas, that's where art comes in. <laughs> and I only had one question, and that is, when you dip everything into the galvanized material so that it would last for many, many years, there also was something quite unique about the original pieces and the way they had decayed and rusted, mm -hmm. maybe because they looked more like the material of the, of the uh, place you finally scrounged them from. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would often find that in the work of certain artists, that Often it was the deterioration of the work that was as interesting as the work itself. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that in architecture as well, in Zumthor's work and so forth. Um, have you ever thought of not galvanizing it and actually letting it decay mm -hmm. over time? Um, yes. And, and also I just want to add that even with the galvanizing, that it seems like that it's non-corrosive and will last forever, that, that if you look closely, there's impurities that come out of that process and kind of cake on to the sculptures that I don't polish away. And they also lose their luster and decay in their own way, just at a much, much exponentially slower rate than if it was rusted. Um, so yeah, I, I was obsessed with the idea of permanence um, when I was making those pieces, and I feel less obsessed with permanence right now. <laughs> Um, because I don't, I don't even know if it matters. Um, so yeah, that's a question I keep asking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any question? Hi, wonderful work. And it, from the different pieces, it seems that there's a different rhythm. Like with this piece, it, like it seems like every body of work has kind of a different rhythm to it in terms of the 
the repetition of the forms and the folds. And I was curious if you could speak a little more about kind of when that sense of the rhythm of a particular piece comes to you. Do you begin with a particular, like, okay, it's going to happen in this kind of a way, or is that something that kind of unfolds through your process? Mm -hmm. um, so, so my process is very intuitive. Um, like, back to, uh, I think it really goes back to, like, the crane, the balloon, the strawberry, and the cup, that I was just making the same folding again and again and again and again, um, and not even learning new folds, and just kind of so that I had it so deeply ingrained that it was muscle memory. And the same thing with these folds um, and, and like making sketches with paper in cafes and stuff like that. It, it was just becoming like muscle memory. So when I would just get the sheets, I would just start folding and not think about it at all. And, and also with the mesh, I just fold and I don't think about it at all. And it's kind of like, it's like, probably any artist's creative process that, um, that, that they just feel like that they have a fever or a frenzy and they just need to like get it out. They're not thinking about it um, and, and just want it to be over. But then <laughs> when, when it's done um, and the, there's, you get some perspective from it, you, it speaks to you and you're like, oh wow, like this is a high and um, this is why I'm doing this. Can you talk a bit about the relationship of this process that you've described and the way you might feel if you were meditating, since it seems like a meditative process? Yeah, it's, well, it's like an active meditation. I've tried meditating before, and I don't have what it takes um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm such a spaz. So, um, so the only thing that can get me to kind of like meditate or slow down is hard labor. And I get that same thing from yoga. Yoga is like, especially like Ashtanga yoga is very active um, and physical. But sometimes some people, they need something um, very active to get outside of their head. Um, and that's, I think, why I've, I've chosen like challenging materials. And, and that's really what's inspired me is, is like taking a material like metal and having like a, a small person that you know you'd see on the street and you didn't think like hit steel with a sledgehammer or was doing welding or or changing the structures of of uh, welded metal into a different shape. In the photo you showed of the dance with the instructor pulling mm -hmm. the dancer, uh, you can sense the release from the movement, the attenuated movement, and then there's the release. Mm -hmm. And h how does that relate to your work? Because even though your work is static, mm -hmm. it feels very energetic. Well, also the process is very energetic. Like the in the, in the slides where I'm um, in that folded kind of curve, that I'm kind of pushing both ends flat and then it curves the other way when it turns into the column. So um, it's, it's all about learning how to make a structure and then pushing it to its bending point. So like when you're pushing something, a material before it reaches its point of bending, like when it becomes elastic, it, it seems like it's not gonna go anywhere. And um, and you feel like like you're just like hitting your yourself against a wall, and that you're not going to go anywhere. But once you get that push, and it reaches the point of bending, it just becomes soft like butter and completely pliant, and turns into a completely different material. And 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 that is kind of like where you get the energy from, because it's like a miracle. To to see that that like that that a person can change a m static material and make it something dynamic, or at least make the process dynamic, it feels very rewarding to do that. My question has to do with uh, how do you know you're finished? <laughs> Quite often, my uh, teacher is saying you must know when to stop, and I don't. 
<laughs> Obviously, you do. <laughs> well, Jackson Pollock said it in a much more inappropriate way. <laughs> but I would refer to him for that. <laughs> and I won't repeat it. <laughs> I'll what? tell you later. <laughs> What made you take these examples of fashion and ballet and make it so personal into your art? Because that was my life. Um, I was, uh, and still am, like, uh, very, like, I have an overdeveloped inner life, and, like, ballet is, like, perfect for that because it's very, like, you learn discipline, it's very repetitive. It's also very much like the folding that I do because, it's all about doing the same boring movements again and again forever. Um, and, and then fashion is really from, from just being in pop culture in our world. You know, like I think that if I was probably a tween today, you know, I'd be obsessed with like Kim Kardashian and like, and honestly, I'm terrified to know like how I would turn out um, today because the world seems like it hasn't been that, that many years or whatever, but I feel like things are really a lot different um, than when I was growing up playing in the dirt in my backyard. Um, so yeah, I think that if, if you just do what's personal to you, that's, that's all that matters. How involved are you in uh, the lighting of the display of your materials? Because I find the lighting is so important. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it just really depends on the space. Um, I really like, my favorite lighting is really day lighting and natural lighting. Um, and, and I like that because like the materials I work with, the process of working with these materials, daylight is dynamic. Um, but I also, um, you know, all of the technology with LEDs and, and lighting, lighting is its own art and its own science. Um, so uh, I'm not super involved and I'm also not super knowledgeable about lighting. Um, It, it's just very, uh, it's just very intuitive, yeah. And I just refer to other people for that. <laughs> you can't do everything. Thank you. Hi, uh, beautiful talk and sci and and art. Um, you talk about the intuitive element of making this art. Mm -hmm. It's interesting looking at it from another perspective, sort of more of a scientist. It has a certain geometry mm -hmm. and a certain pattern and mm -hmm. a certain science to it. Mm -hmm given the fact that you have the tools of architecture and those things, have you thought about what it adds up to from the other side? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I've, like, I've taken math classes for fun, and I love mathematics and science, um, but I think that, that my biggest influence really is nature, and in nature you find um, the most amazing geometries, and uh, you know, sometimes someone asks me um, if if my piece came that way, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, no, I made it. Um, so that's kind of like the ultimate compliment because that's what that's what nature is all about. Like it just came that way, um, and we really can't compete with that. But that's that's what I strive for, and that's what I'm influenced by the most: fresh air. Oh, I see one in the back, right there. So, so how has this work affected your architecture? I'm still figuring that one out. <laughs> Any ideas? Um, I, think, I think mainly simplicity. You know, you would say like, oh, like maybe take take the the folds and turn it into a building facade or something like that. But I think that if you take the idea of the folds then and translate it to architecture, then you just get a building really that's connected with nature and as simple as it can possibly be. Um, so 
so yeah, th I mean, that's my dream is, is to do more buildings in nature, su surrounded just by nature. With elemental materials, not too many materials at once. Any other questions? I saw uh, younger crowds come in. Uh, <laughs> um, do you have any questions to Ms. Redick? No? Okay, well, if you do, uh, please talk to her in the. Oh, okay. I would like to know why do you complement your art as simple? Is it because you're comparing it to more of a simple process like nature? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear because you were very quiet. I would like to know why you complement your art as simple. Is mm -hmm. it because you're complementing it to the process of nature? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I think that some of it is simple and some is not simple. So like the the metal pieces uh, are pretty elemental, like they are start from materials that come like out of a mill that nothing's been done to them. And then there's the assemblages that everything was found and recycled and every material used in them had its own life before it got to the wall. Um, so, I mean, just like everything in life, some things are simple and some things aren't. And I like to deal with both of those separately. <laughs> Mine is more of a statement, but your art is so full of joy and hope. And it's so nice to see that because a lot of art today is extremely depressing. <laughs> and, and I'm just wondering, you must, your spirit must be a spirit of hope. I would say that, yeah, thank you. Um, I strive for that, but I'm both. <laughs> Any other questions? Right, if you do, um, we will open uh, the gallery for you. Um, and also we offer tea. So if you have any questions, please ask her. If you have any questions about this uh, facility, please talk to me or uh, Mr. Um, Higuchi, who's been just passing the microphone, and also him, <laughs> my colleague there. Um, well, Please give another round of applause to Ms. Rettig. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So we invite you to the gallery for uh, refreshment. And uh, again, please ask any questions to her. She is going to be available. Thank you all for coming.